Grace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We welcome you to worship this morning. Glad you're here. We had a team yesterday that helped take down the Christmas decorations. So the sanctuary, when it's just after Christmas, looks so stark, and yet it's like a clean slate. And we begin our year together, our, our calendar year, um, and the opportunity to fill this with faithfulness and fill this space with the love of a worshiping congregation. And by the way, if you have the urge to um, provide flowers some Sunday, the flower chart is out in the fellowship hall, and um, these tables could be filled anytime you would like to do that. And faith, we are ready for let us confess our sin to God and to one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Know this. And be at peace. Let us greet one another with that peace. The peace of Christ be with you. Please pray with me. Come, Holy Spirit, heavenly dove, open our ears to the truth of your word, that the testimony of Christ may be strengthened among us and the glad news of deliverance revealed. Amen. Our first lesson this morning is from Isaiah, chapter 49, verses 1 through 7. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord and my reward with my God. And now the Lord says, who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him, for I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the slave of rulers. Kings shall see and stand up, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. And then from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, 
verses 1 through 9. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus, for in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And finally, from John, the first chapter, verses 29 through 42. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The word of the Lord. The scriptures this morning draw us to discipleship. But along the way, they use imagery and playfulness with words that's really pretty compelling. Your bulletin cover is a detail that honestly is up there every Sunday. It's the, the symbol of the resurrection lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, but with a banner marching as if into the wind, the resurrection symbol of the church and at the intersection of the cross that is in front of us every Sunday. Ironically, one of the ways you can tell the Bible is getting really serious is when it starts becoming playful and makes the most use of humor. The wordplay and imagery begins in the Isaiah passage, and I think we have an unspoken rule in this church not to encourage that portion of the crowd that lives with puns. But I have to affirm Tom Hanser, who noticed the pun in this passage. It is 
it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the world. It is too light a thing I will give you as a light. The passage as a whole is exquisite. The metaphor emerges, God's people are like an arrow in the quiver of God's um, keeping, and as God is about to, to use the bow and arrow and the, pull this arrow out of the quiver, the question is, for what purpose? Might this just be target practice? Or is there something more important? The prophetic voice says, I have labored in vain, I have spent my strength for nothing in vanity. In, not, in, in effort, I'm sorry, in effect, why put all this effort in? God doesn't seem to be doing anything much useful with me now. That's what the prophet considers aloud, thinking apparently for all of Israel, and perhaps for you and for me. The prophetic voice from Isaiah speaking to the Hebrew people in exile describes the frustration of fervent hope overtaken by events around. As the prophecy promises a return home, the implied question is simple. Is that all there is? Is that all that God can do with us? All that God has in mind for us? I got inspired and went to Joseph Beth yesterday to buy a book only to find that it isn't out yet. I'd been reading reviews of it and I read enough reviews that I was sure I wanted to read this book on Martin Luther King weekend. The title of the book is Tears We Cannot Stop. The subtitle, A Sermon to White America. It's written by Michael Eric Dyson, who's an African-American preacher. I feel a renewed sense of responsibility in this nation right now. I continue to believe that privileged people like me have a role in yet bringing this great nation to, to the potential described at the most significant points in our history. Ironically, the book won't be out until the day after Martin Luther King's birthday is observed, although his birthday is actually today. But I'm gonna to have to wait for the book, and waiting is probably a darn good thing to tune into when thinking about the civil rights movement in general. I mean, it was 100 years after the Emancipa Emancipation Proclamation before Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, spoken in August of 63. Many had given their lives for the cause, many had waited. But when Dr. King brought his eloquence and his energy to the churches in Montgomery, building upon the simple gestures of faith and hope expressed in the lives of people like Rosa Parks, God's purpose was served. Years later, when I was a young pastor in suburb suburban Detroit, the races in working together in Detroit were still trying to hammer out the vision even 10 years after Dr. King had been killed. I can still recall the rhythm of those conversations. We would get together with hope and expectation. We were gonna forge a new community that would be blacks and whites working well together and racism would fall by the wayside. But I also remember that those meetings bogged down in the humanity of all of us. Our best intentions met with the problems of who we are as people. But I also remember that in almost every one of those contexts, some, usually a guy, always African American, always older, in the group would say, I remember when Martin said to me, and the room got quiet. Nobody in the room needed to know who was Martin. And we were all inspired by his witness to rekindle our effort. Martin King was born 88 years ago today. But still this sermon to white America, the book Tears We Cannot Stop Must Be Written. Michael Eric Dyson, another black preacher, able apparently, I'll tell you after I read the book, able to articulate what must be said about the peculiar problem of race in our nation now and into the future. The scriptures speak eloquently if only we can recognize what this wordplay is pointing us to. 
It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. The church does not exist for the church. That's too light a thing. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. There was a time when the visionaries who were trying to find direction in this congregation in the late 80s hired a woman named Carolyn Weiss who came and wrote a report trying to summarize what she experienced here. And she used an interesting metaphor. She looked at that steeple and she saw it as a lighthouse, a light to the nations, a light to the world around. Well, you know, a lot of churches have floodlights on a steeple. But what we've got is eight light bulbs up there. And by the way, they're the hardest light bulbs in the whole building to change. <laughs> I've been there, done that. But what is the purpose of the church? Those light bulbs were first put in, by the way, in 1963, just months after Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. That somehow seems interesting to me. It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. God's people in the time of Isaiah the prophet were dispersed around the, around the globe by accidents of politics and wars. This section of Isaiah's prophecy at first considers the idea of let's get everybody back together again, but then says that's too light a thing. God has more in mind. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians was still working on that question. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those in every place who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. When this congregation stumbled and nearly fell apart 30 years after it had merged as two congregations. We became a statistic among many such mergers. It turns out church mergers are one of the hardest things to do. But the Presbytery team that came in here and worked hard to get this congregation moving forward, and I would claim we are moving forward. But they said one thing that we have not ever gotten around to. They said, you know what, this congregation ought to read 1 Corinthians and ought to look through 1 Corinthians because there are ways in which that book and our lives together have a lot in common. Out of the whole Bible, they picked that portion. Why? What was there? Well, I would say we need to go no further than the next paragraph of what Paul wrote. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given to you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and in knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him, you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. I'm absolutely serious. I think that's what they were wanting us to find, is that affirmation. Affirmation for a congregation such as this. Affirmation that the grace of God has been given you. Affirmation that in every way you, we have been enriched in him. Affirmation that the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among us and affirmation that we are not lacking any spiritual gift. And this, God is faithful. By him, you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The scriptures this morning say many things, but they're saying it with humor and wordplay and an interesting energy. The pun of the Old Testament prophet, the affirmation that harsh old Paul has such kind and thoughtful things to say. And then there's John the Baptist. The gospel picks up the story right after Jesus was baptized by John. The next day, 
John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. Now, if that's not wordplay, I don't know what is. After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him. But I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed. There's a great old story about a monastery, a faith community, that got stale. They were tired. They had lost their energy. They really didn't know what was coming next. But then, somehow, a prophetic rumor started among them. And the rumor was the Messiah was coming. And the rumor was that the Messiah was here. And the rumor was that the Messiah was one of them. And everything changed. They started looking at each other and saying, I see the Messiah in that one. I see the Messiah. And they found the presence of God in each other. And it made a difference. John the Baptist had an assignment just like that. Each one he baptized, you can picture him looking for the signs. No, no. It was probably like that great story in Samuel where the prophet was sent after King Saul was a bust. And he goes and he's told that one of the sons of Jesse will be the next king. And so he says to Jesse, bring out the boys. And so the first one, no, no. And then finally, is that all you got? Well, there's David. <laughs> yeah, it is David. It turns out little David, who was tending the sheep, while his more likely brothers were considered for important work, God's people are strengthened for God's purpose. When we begin searching for God's presence in each other, honestly, that's what we find. That's when we find God's presence and understand God's call. But how do we do that? Now, here. John the Baptist found the right one. He said, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one. I think part of what Scripture tells us is that we have the resources to know when we're doing the right thing, when we're going the right direction, when God is indeed speaking to us and therefore through us. John spread the news. John's followers were standing with him. His disciples, those who followed his teaching, his guidance, and John said, here, here's the Lamb of God. And Jesus turned and saw them following, and he said, what are you looking for? Sometimes we hear the question with you as singular. Are you talking to me, Jesus? But the Bible almost always intends the plural. What are you looking for? What did you have in mind building a sanctuary this big, this many seats, this much opportunity to be a strong church? What urge caused you to put some light bulbs way up there where it's a pain in the neck to change them? What wasn't right that caused this church to split? And how have we fixed that problem? And how are we looking for the presence of God in each other? What is God's purpose expressed through us? Not as individuals, but as a body of Christ. And what has the vision of hospitality in these recent days really meant to our understanding of the presence of God in our midst? Or as Jesus said, what are you looking for? Notice the humor of the pun, the call to be a light to the nations. Notice that the presence of Jesus Christ in our individual lives is what brings us here together with all the resources we can bring, our faith, our hope, our love. God must have a purpose in all of this. The news is much like the vision of the faith community, which heard that the Messiah was among them. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah. He brought Simon to Jesus. 
who looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas. We are called, you and I, to bring disciples to Jesus, to marvel as Christ calls each one by name, as God's seal in baptism is celebrated, and as we together become light for the world in Jesus Christ. In this dark world, God's light is needed now more than ever. Let us pray. Loving and graceful God, we give you thanks. Inspire us to be all that you would have us be as your people, as your church, as your witnesses. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.